Okay, so welcome back to um, our lecture on introduction to banking. Uh, last week uh, we stopped and we finished with section 4.1 on commercial banking and now we'll continue with investment banking. So what is investment banking and what um, can we say about uh, this important function of uh, universal banks. Now, um, so far we've talked about the traditional services a bank offers, that is lending, most of all, giving out loans to retail customers, to um, firms, and to take in deposits and finance um, your lending activities by using deposits. In the next part of this lecture, we'll now focus on investment banking. Investment banking being uh, a large and very important part of modern banks, um, but a part that is uh, not as clear cut as, say, for example, lending and traditional banking. Why? Because um, you um, can, it's, it's rather difficult to define investment banking um, with, say, one service or two services like deposit taking and lending business. But with investment banking, it is rather the case that um, this encompasses all the services a bank may offer that are related and things that are related to capital markets. So if you were to divide all those activities of investment banks into different areas, you can see uh, that first of all, one important part of investment banking is valuation. You have leveraged buyouts, IPOs and merchants and acquisitions, and last but not least, trading and structuring. So what is an investment bank or an, at least an investment bank uh, department of a bank? It's a financial institution that helps clients with wealth management, raising capital, for example, by issuing new securities and trading securities. So again, you can see it's everything that is related to capital markets. How can we raise funding? How can we raise capital, equity or debt? How can we trade securities and how can we invest our capital? So this is what an investment bank does. And basically it tries to advise, it tries to consult with, and it tries to, um, to help customers um, when dealing with financial and capital markets. In contrast to commercial banks, investment banks do not take deposits. So this is a defining difference between commercial banking and investment banking. Investment banking should at least have never have anything to do with deposits and deposit taking. You can then distinguish and differentiate um, the different services offered by investment bank by looking at the buy side and the sell side related activities. On the buy side, the investment bank advises companies regarding future investments, so what to buy, uh, how to securitize um, and how to sell created financial products to your clients. So again, the clients, which could be other banks, investment uh, companies, asset managers or insurers and so on, they are buying securitized um, financial instruments or um, securitized loans um, or any other um, financial product from the investment bank. So this is the buy side related activities because now in this case, the clients are buying something and the investment bank is helping the clients to buy and to invest. On the sell side, you have securities trading, you have market making, you have underwriting and marketing uh, services during an initial public offering, and you have research or analyst reports that are being prepared um, for your clients um, on, say, um, a stock. Um, just to be sure that you all know what market making means, it means that you are providing bid and ask quotes uh, to keep a securities market liquid. So for example, you are making your market making uh, in the sense that you are standing ready to buy and sell the stocks of say Apple. Um, and by standing ready, by offering bid and ask quotes, uh, buy and sell prices, um, you're providing the market with liquidity. Now, on this uh, slide, you can see uh, again, uh, the private side, the sell side, and the public side, which is the buy side. Uh, you can see that um, we have the investment bank here, uh, seen as an agent of capital. Uh, you have uh, those companies and clients that are in need 
of capital. They might be interested in uh, taking over a company as a target. So they are in need of capital. The investment bank acts as an agent of capital on the private side and the investment bank now acts as the service provider to those companies that are interested in buying this company here. And in the intermediary between the public and the private side, you have a syndicate that acts as the liaison between banking, the client and sales and trading. And here you have capital markets. So on the other side, you have institutional investors, banks, insurance companies, asset managers who have capital principles uh, they need to invest. And this is the public side. So the investment bank, or for example, here at this side, the syndicate, they now help, for example, in sales and trading, in selling, um, for example, debt instruments to the institutional investors. So this is the public buy side. So they um, are interested in buying um, those securities that are uh, created, for example, with the help of the investment bank on the private sell side. So, in essence, this is one example uh, where an investment bank can help you as a company, as a client. Uh, the investment bank will help the client to create, for example, a bond, to issue a bond and sell the bond on the market. And the bond is then sold via sales and trading activities of the same or another investment bank to those institutional investors on the public buy side. Whereas on the private sell side, the investment bank is advising the companies and the clients here how to um, get the funding. Now, investment banks can also be divided into a front office, a middle office and a back office. In the terms front, middle and back refer to the proximity to the bank's customers. So in the front office, you'll usually find those traders and those uh, bankers that interact with customers and clients directly. You will see, for example, in a movie, what you would see bankers sitting in an office, picking up their phones, talking to clients, trying to sell clients and sell institutional investors uh, financial products. In the middle office, you will usually have some um, auxiliary services that are meant to control and to monitor the activities of the front office. And you will have a back office that is basically concerned about facilitating the activities of the front and middle office with the least interaction with customers. In the front office, you will have, for example, sales. In the middle office, you will have risk management and risk controlling. And in the back office, you'll usually find IT and other contract and legal services. So in the front office, you have the acquisition of potential M&A clients. How is this done? Um, those bankers will create a pitch book including subsequent support. They will offer and structure financing opportunities. They will try to sell and trade securities and offer them to potential clients. You will also see proprietary trading, uh, securities trading on the own account of the bank. And you will see research, that is research analysts that are analyzing clients, but also counseling and advising clients on future acquisitions. Risk management is usually risk, uh, no, middle office is usually uh, comprised of risk management and also corporate treasury. Um, corporate treasury is the department, also in industrial companies, that is in charge of monitoring liquidity. Um, that is keeping an account and checking the outgoing cash flows, uh, making sure that you have enough liquidity in your company. And in case you see a mismatch between available liquidity and um, outgoing cash flows, you need to come up with more cash and you need to liquidate certain assets in order um, to be able to um, pay your short term obligations. On the other hand, if corporate treasury sees that you have too much cash on hand, corporate treasury can then try to invest this money. So risk management, treasury, those are some functions that are in the middle office of an investment bank and in the back office you will have technical control of transactions, IT, uh, including maybe complex algorithms for security trading. So it's not just um, a minuscule auxiliary function here, but it can also include algorithmic trading that is nevertheless done in the back office. Okay. 
Now the question here is, where do you think would the introduction of a Chinese wall make sense within an investment bank? Now, first of all, you need to be sure uh, to know what a Chinese wall is. A Chinese wall in the context of an investment bank is um, a separation of information processes, of responsibilities and functions within a firm to make sure that, for example, one department does not talk business with another department. So you're trying to include a Chinese wall, which is a virtual wall, between, say, two departments so that they cannot interact um, in, in a business sense. They can, of course, talk uh, to each other uh, at lunch, but nevertheless, they're not allowed to talk business uh, with each other. Um, this here, uh, a Chinese wall, is often found in investment banks. Um, and the question now is, where would you think such an introduction of a Chinese wall makes sense? Uh, very simple, just go back uh, to this slide and you can already assume where um, a Chinese wall does make sense. Actually here, um, first of all, between the buy and the sell side, because imagine you as an investment bank were advising a company which company to buy, which target to buy, and how to finance this deal. And then uh, you have no um, separation between this department and sales and trading, and even worse, uh, the research department and research analysts. That is, you have a department in your investment bank that analyzes companies. You have a department that tries to help companies finance, say, a merger and acquisition. And then you also have sales and trading who are trying to sell uh, and trade on stocks. If you have no and uh, none whatsoever um, uh, Chinese wall and separation of departments in within your investment bank, then you would immediately get, get conflicts of interest. And even worse, if you are a universal bank, it might also be that you have information from your commercial banking activities that you could exploit in investment banking. For example, you've given out a loan to, say, Daimler-Benz. Investment bankers now know that Daimler-Benz is in need of, uh, say, a loan um, or in need of some financing, and they are asked uh, to structure a financing um, structure financing and maybe restructure uh, financing for this client. Now suddenly you also have a research department within your investment bank and they are advising as a neutral observer, I meant as a neutral observer, they're advising clients whether to buy or sell this stock. Now you have confidential private information via this loan from your commercial banking, you have private information uh, from within your investment bank and then it might be that your research analysts can tell other clients whether you should buy or sell the stock of Daimler-Benz. This obviously is a huge conflict of interest because you, you are privy to information uh, that is only meant to be kept within one part of this bank. So there should be a Chinese wall definitely in a universal bank between investment banking and commercial banking, but even within um, especially uh, within investment banking, especially between the research department and the remaining parts, there should be a separation of information flows and uh, responsibilities. Now, just to make sure that you know the largest investment banks in the world, um, there was a time in the United States when we had um, 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 a banking system that uh, separated investment banking from commercial banking and back in those days you only had pure investment banks and pure commercial banks. Because of the uh, deregulation of the uh, Graham Leach Bliley Act in the 1990s, we now have a universal banking system as we've already seen in one of the first lectures in the United States and as a result of this universal banking system, most large commercial banks like Citi, Bank of America, um, they bought other investment banks and they grew enormously in size. So nowadays you can see Merrill Lynch, formerly a huge investment bank, now belongs to Bank of America. It's Bank of America Merrill Lynch. You have Barclays, Citi, uh, Citigroup, which is Citi, Credit Suisse, uh, Deutsche Bank, 
Goldman Sachs is a pure investment bank. JP Morgan, Morgan Stanley, Wells Fargo Securities, but also UBS, those are large uh, global investment banks. This is some data from 2014. You can see uh, the commission income uh, six years ago. JP Morgan with almost 6.4 billion US dollars, Bank of America, Goldman Sachs, Morgan Stanley, and so on and so on. And these are, at least at that point, were the last, uh, the largest 10 investment banks. Apart from these large investment banks, you can also find so-called boutique investment banks. Those are investment banks that are specialized in offering only a few selected services or functions, or they are specialized on a certain industrial sector. So it could be that they are only um, doing business in M&A, or they are only doing business in investment banking for automotive companies. That could be a specialization. Here you can see a number of uh, specialized elite boutiques, for example, Lazar, Evercore, Greenhill, uh, Merlis and Company or Catalyst. Those are just some examples of so-called elite boutiques who uh, have made a name for themselves in uh, specializing on some of these uh, functions and sectors. So let's, next, let's talk about uh, company valuation as one part uh, in investment banking. Now what um, investment banks do is often concerned about uh, coming up with a price for a company uh, in M&A transactions, in IPOs. So most of the time, uh, an important job for investment bankers is to value uh, companies. Company valuation, German Unternehmensbewertung, this is uh, hugely and immensely important for investment banks. And the valuation of possible target companies is usually based on an analysis of annual financial statements, of annual reports and available capital market data, like, for example, stock prices. So before discussing the basis uh, and the basics of firm valuation, let's briefly discuss the basics of balance sheet analysis as the most important tool we need for company valuation. Now, let's take this um, example balance sheet of uh, Ryanair in 2007 and you can immediately see uh, the common features of a balance sheet. Uh, you can see total assets, you can see current and non-current assets and current liabilities, non-current liabilities. What you need to do now is to take the balance sheet, also include the income statement which is shown here, for example, to see the operating revenues, the operating expenses, to see um, the total income and profit before tax, which in this case was almost 510 million, well, probably gone down since then, um, and also the cash flow, the consolidated cash flow statement. And based on these three components of the annual report, the balance sheet, the income statement, and the consolidated cash flow statement, Bilanz, G&V und Kapitalflussrechnung, uh, uh, you can in the next step calculate financial ratios. Using those financial ratios as part of a balance sheet analysis, you can then compare those balance sheet ratios and financial ratios from company A to company B or from company A to a peer group of other companies in the same sector. And then this is usually your starting point for a corporate valuation because in the end, uh, theoretically, what should the company value, firm value look like? Well, it should be uh, the discounted value of all the future cash flows that uh, you're entitled to when you're owning the company as a debt or a shareholder. Uh, so what that means is you will need to forecast your future cash flows and you need to discount those future cash flows. That's one possibility. That's a discounted cash flow approach, DCF approach. Or you simply compare uh, you um, you estimate a multiplier, say for example for equity, and you can see from a peer group analysis, if you are given say stock market data, uh, you can see that for example the peer group has an equity multiplier of 10. So you take the stock price or the market capitalization um, and you see that um, the um, for example the 500 million or 510 million in profits before taxes of Ryanair 
they should be multiplied by say 10, the factor 10 by the equity multiplier to get to an estimate for the market value of equity. And how do you calculate this equity multiplier? By looking at a peer group and then by taking this equity multiplier and multiplying it with say for example um, the um, return, no, um, the profit or the EBIT of this company. So um, take the annual report, balance sheet income statement, make it comparable and then uh, use a method from corporate and firm valuation um, to value this company. So let's go one step back. Uh, if we are given an annual report, we need to make sure that we are comparing apples to apples. So differences between annual financial statements do exist and they can result from say different accounting systems, different accounting among business sectors or industrial sectors and different company sizes. However, the comparability of key figures based on financial statements is of course of particular importance for company valuations. So you need to make sure that those financial statements are indeed comparable. Also, problems can arise when comparing key figures and balance sheets from different years in different currencies. And let me just see, so in different, there needs to be a space here. So different currencies, different points in time, they might cause a problem when comparing the financial statements of different companies. And one possible solution could be to calculate percentage quantities, to calculate financial ratios. And one example is all balance sheet and income statement items are shown relative to total assets or total turnover. So let's have a look at this first idea of stating all those items on the balance sheet uh, relative to total assets and as you can see for example Ryanair held 62% of its total assets in non-current assets and it had um, an equity ratio of approximately 44% so 44% uh, of its balance sheet were due to shareholders equity. Same thing can be done here with the income statement you can see that they spend almost 76% of their total operating revenues on operating expenses and the profit before tax is 24% of their revenues. So possible solutions for the comparison of annual statements can be compare the company's key figures over time and you will see a time trend or choose one year and compare those key figures and ratios to similar companies. So do a peer group analysis and then you can see for example this company has a financial ratio, a return on equity of 10%. In the peer group the return on equity is 5% so this company is doing much much better than its peer group. So this can be done. Which financial ratios should you use then? Um, you can use short-term solvency, short-term liquidity ratios. You can use long-term solvency financial leverage ratios, you can use asset management or turnover ratios and then of course profitability and market value ratios. So let's start with the most basic one, the current ratio. What is the current ratio? The current ratio is current assets divided by current liabilities. In the case of Ryanair this is a ratio of 2.11 meaning that for example for creditors, especially for short-term creditors, the higher the current ratio in this case 2.11, the better. It means that the company is able to pay its short-term obligations, its short-term debt, at least 2.11 times. For companies, however, uh, the um, ratio indicates sufficient liquidity, but also it might indicate an inefficient use of capital because it's wasted in liquidity that is just lying around idly. So current ratio of at least one is desirable. A current ratio that is higher expresses that the net current assets are negative. Actually, uh, no, if the current ratio is smaller, you have a net current assets that are negative. And if it's higher than one, it's indicative of an inefficient use of cash because uh, you have too much liquidity on your balance sheet. 
Total debt ratio as a long-term solvency ratio indicates the ability of your firm to meet your obligations in the long run, or more generally, your debt level. First of all, the total debt ratio. It takes into account the receivables of all terms for creditors, and it's defined by total assets minus total equity over total assets. So in essence, it's total debt divided by total assets. We can also define, uh, define two helpful variations, the debt to equity ratio and the so-called equity multiplier. Now, this is here the debt to equity ratio, total liabilities divided by total equity, and total assets divided by total equity gives you the equity multiplier. And in our example of Ryanair, they used 56% in debt, and Ryanair had 56 cent on every euro in assets. Next, we want to look at some profitability measures. First of all, the profit margin. Profitability measures, obviously, the purpose or have the purpose to measure how efficient the company is in using its assets and making a profit out of the assets used. So first of all, the profit margin is defined as net income over revenue. And all things equal, a relatively high profit margin is desirable as this corresponds to low costs to sales ratio. However, when reducing sales prices, this usually leads to increased sales volume. It reduces profit margins at the same time. And similarly, the total income or more importantly, the cash flow from current business activities could have gone up or down. So therefore, it's not necessarily bad if margins are smaller. If you look at certain industries, you will find margins being extremely high as in the luxury industry uh, or being rather small in the retail business. Probably an even more and frequently used profitability measure is the return on assets. It's a measure of profit per asset and it can be defined in different ways. But the most common is ROA, ROA is defined as net income over total assets. For Ryanair, the return on assets was 7.75%. So meaning that for each euro in total assets it used in 2007, I think, uh, Ryanair generated almost 8 cents in profit. A variation then is the return on equity. The return on assets is the return on debt and equity. And we can then define the return on equity, which simply measures the shareholder's profit over one year. Net income divided by total equity. In the case of Ryanair, you get almost 80% uh, return on equity. So on every euro in equity, Ryanair generated more than 17% or 17 euro cents as profit. Since ROA and return on equity are frequently quoted figures, it should be emphasized that these are accounting returns. Uh, the debt and equity are taken from um, the balance sheet and thus they are book or should rather be called return on book assets and return on book equity. If your company is bankrupt, it might be that your balance sheet is not current and it's uh, not up to date so um, obviously this is book equity and book assets return on assets and return on equity and the other figures they are also uh, related to um, this following equation we've seen that return on equity is defined as net income over total equity and then you can also simply add assets by assets times revenue divided by revenue. It's the usual definition of return on equity. The latter two uh, parts uh, at first seem trivial, but if you rearrange this equation a little bit, you get the so-called DuPont uh, decomposition, the DuPont mesh method, which tells you that return on equity is actually decomposed into the profit margin, the total asset turnover, and the equity multiplier, which means that in order to drive up the return on your equity, you have three levers, you have three uh, focal points at which you can attack. The first one is profit margin. Try to squeeze out more income per each euro in revenues. 
The second one is total asset turnover, squeeze out more revenues, increase revenues for each euro or dollar used in assets. And the third one is financial leverage. It's assets by total equity. Make sure you, that you can generate the same revenue with less equity. So this would also increase the return on equity. So operating efficiency is the first one. Asset use efficiency is the second one. And financial leverage is the third part that can also be used as a lever to increase the return on equity. Weaknesses in one of the two or both efficiencies operating or asset use will be followed by a lower return on assets, which means a lower ROI. And again, you can use any of these three levers or if your return on equity is too low, you can start looking for causes uh, in operating, asset use, efficiency or financial leverage. Next, uh, we are looking at market values, market value measures, so measures uh, that are trying to measure the market valuation uh, of this company. So for listed companies, you can use the share price. Uh, this is clear. Um, so what can we do? First measure, market value, is the so-called price earnings or PE ratio. The PE ratio is defined as the share price divided by the pair share earnings. The pair share, uh, no, the price earnings ratio measures how much investors would pay per unit of current income and high price earnings ratio are often treated as an indicator of a significant future growth. In the case of Ryanair, uh, the PE ratio is 4 euros and 62 cents divided by 29.7 euro cents. So it's almost 16 times. That's the PE ratio for Ryanair in 2007. Another common measure, measure is the market to book ratio. It's defined as the per share market value divided by the per share book value. Now mind again that the per share book value equals total equity divided by the total number of issued shares and the per share book value is an accounting number that reflects historical costs and not actual current ones. Therefore, one could argue that the market to book ratio compares the market value of investments of one company with its historical expenses. And a value less than one could mean that the company was not successful to create value for shareholders in total. And in case of, oh, there's the typo again here, market to book ratio. So in 2007, the market to book ratio for Ryanair was 2.75 times. Okay. Again, with market valuation and firm valuation, you would then continue to use these financial ratios. For example, forecast future cash flows, or you could forecast and try to come up with a peer group and then use peer group analysis to make an estimate for um, your equity multiplier and then come up with an estimate for uh, the true market valuation of the equity of this company that you are trying to value. Next, let's talk about leveraged buyouts. What is a leveraged buyout? In a leveraged buyout or simply LBO in short, an investor or a group of investors buys a target company and finances this purchase with a small amount of equity and a substantial amount of debt of a borrowed capital. So you have high, high leverage that is used uh, for taking over this company or for purchasing this company. And the profits and assets of the target company are then used to hedge the borrowed capital and to service interest claims. And these leveraged buyouts are very typical for so-called private equity investors. You have private equity, you're trying to take over a company that is not listed, that is not has not a uh, stock price and a, and a share. And what you're trying to do is you're using very little equity, high leverage, taking over this company, and then using the profits and uh, the return from this company to pay interest and pay back the debt. And then after usually five to 10 years, you plan your exit and you sell off this company after performing usually a turnover and turnaround strategy. 
There are different strategies for leverage buyouts. The first one is a management buyout. You purchase a significant portion of equity, and this is done by current management or a company's board of directors. So you have an MBO, and actually the current management buys off and pays off the old investors, the old owners, and managers take over the company themselves. With an MBA, the management buy-in, you have a significant part of a company's equity that is bought up by an external management team that comes in and takes over management. You then have a secondary or a tertiary buyout that is a leveraged buyout of a company in which both the buyer and the seller are again private equity investors or financial sponsors of a leveraged buyout. So you have, um, say, uh, a company that is owned by its founding family. You have a leveraged buyout by a private equity investor who comes in, takes over this company, and then at some point the private equity company A sells the company to the next private equity company. So this is a secondary buyout and of course can go on and on if uh, you have an yet another private equity investor who comes in. This is a tertiary buyout. Very good example for this in Germany is Grohe. Uh, Groha, a manufacturer of um, um, home appliances, um, it was um, bought uh, in a managed, no, not a management, but a private equity investment uh, buyout, and I think it has now undergone its tertiary or even its fourth buyout. So, has a history of being bought and sold by private equity investors. Question now is, what can an investment bank do in? And the cause of an LBO, um, an investment bank can take over the following tasks. First of all, the investment bank can help you identify the potential target companies. It can then do a valuation of the target company. It can support the transaction, advise you on structuring the financing, how to come up with all that leverage. Uh, it can place the bonds that are used for debt financing. It can also help in debt financing the new company. And then at the end of this buyout, after five years, it can advise and support the private equity investors in the cause of an IPO when the private equity investors want to exit from this investment. What you're then usually doing in these leverage buyouts in uh, an investment bank is you will come up with an LBO model. You first need to make some estimates regarding the purchasing price. What is the company value? What is firm value? What are the interest rates? How much should we pay for this company? You should then should use and create a sources and uses list. That is, what do you need in capital and where does it come from? Bank loan, private equity, etc. Then you need to forecast the financial statements and selected key financial ratios and figures into the future, say for the next five years, because this is the uh, investment horizon of your private equity investor. And then uh, you have to determine possible repayments to external lenders. You have to adapt the balance sheet to the new capital structure and to see how likely the company you are buying will evolve over this next five years. And then you have to exit, uh, plan your exit and estimate the return for your equity investors and see if this is worth your while. That's an LBO model. Now, which characteristics make a company attractive for private equity investors and therefore for an LBO? First of all, a strong, effective management. After the LBO, management must work together with the new owners in order to leverage the company's earnings potential, thus satisfy the investor's demand for high returns under the new capital structure. Could also be um, that you see a highly inefficient, ineffective management. In this case, you need to make sure that you are able to fire old management. If you have a low debt ratio, it means um, as part of your leverage buyout, you're simply replacing equity with debt. You're driving up leverage and using the leverage effect uh, to increase your return on equity because you're not using too much private equity. So if the company already has a high debt ratio, this is a company for which you cannot increase leverage too much. But if you find a company that has a low debt ratio, this is of course of high interest to private equity investors. If you have a solid wealth structure, 
the external lenders in an LBO, they will expect the company's high level of debt to be secured by enough liquid assets. You cannot buy a company that is broke, that is bankrupt and drive leverage even higher, but you are looking for a company that has a solid asset structure. And companies that do not possess valuable fixed assets or only intangible assets are therefore rather poor LBO candidates. And low operating risk and stable cash flows, these will increase the probability uh, that you are able to service your external lenders' claims and to pay interest on all that leverage. Companies with a low price earnings ratios, companies that are considered as rather unprofitable by the market, offer the best opportunities for LBOs because investors hope that the LBO and a change in strategy, a change in management, will enable the company to greatly increase your profits and profit potentials. Also, if parts of the company do not fit to the holding or portfolio, it might often be that, or let's go back one step, in many cases you as a private equity investor and an investment bank that advises private equity investors, you're looking for companies that are undervalued. The company should be worth more, but for some reason, bad management, the market is just too stupid to see the true value of the company, or a different reason that is on, on this slide here, you're trying to identify companies that are undervalued. And in this case, you could argue that it might be that the majority of this company you are trying to buy is actually quite profitable, but there is also one part that doesn't really fit into this conglomerate, into this holding, and what you're trying to do then in the LBO is you buy the company, you split it up, you sell off this part that doesn't fit into the larger picture of this investment portfolio, and then the sum of all those individual parts is larger than the price you have to pay for the whole holding or this whole company, and this might be something that you identify as a private equity investor and that gives you an edge over the market. Okay, leverage buyouts. Next, let's talk about IPOs and mergers and acquisitions. What are you trying to do in an IPO transaction? In an IPO transaction, as an investment bank, you are advising a company to go public. You are advising a company to place stocks, to place shares on capital markets and to sell a part of the company's equity and to raise equity. Now, obviously, we now have different alternative ways of issuing new shares, of issuing these equity instruments, and we can do either a private placement or placing, or we can do a public issue. What is the one, what is the other? Now, the first one is you're doing it privately. You are looking for investors, few hand-selected institutional investors, uh, to which you are placing and selling uh, those stocks. This is a private issue. With a public issue, you are publicly announcing that the company's shares will be traded on a certain stock exchange and the company has to register at the exchange it wants to be listed at and this now is a public issue. With public issues, there are two different types. First of all, a general takeover offer within a cash offer, the equity capital is to sold to all interested investors. So an IPO, an initial public offering or so-called unseasoned new issue, this is a first public issue of a company. With a rights, rights issue, um, you are selling equity capital to already invested shareholders. And a season new issue is an example for this, which is a new offer after a previous IPO has been done with the company securities already having been issued before. German, quite clearly, IPO is in Börsengang. Uh, season new issue and um, rights issue is eine Kapitalerhöhung. Das Unternehmen ist bereits notiert, hat bereits Aktien emittiert und es wird einfach nur das Kapital erhöht. So that's a rights issue. With a public issue, what is done usually uh, over the course of a couple of months? You first have a Pathfinder prospectus, which is the first preliminary prospectus that presents the proposed offer. 
uh, usually done a few months before the issue. You have pre-underwriting conferences and the amount of money that has to be raised and the types of securities that will be issued are discussed. You will collect first expressions of interest by institutional investors and try to determine an issue price. And the determination of an underwriter and improved consultant investment banks this is also done in these pre-underwriting conferences with investment banks, of course. And this is done maybe four months before the prospectus is issued. Then, a few weeks before the offer, uh, you have to compile the complete prospectus, which will now include all relevant financial entrepreneurial information, which is just like a marketing tool to tell investors, this is a nice company, you should buy its share. Then. You have the public issuance and sale. So in a typical firm commitment contract, the underwriter, which is a, usually an investment bank, buys a defined amount of equity, sells it at a slightly higher price on the market, and the underwriting syndicate of investment banks helps with this sale shortly after the last day of registration. And sometimes after the offer, you also have a market stabilization phase in which the underwriter stands ready to place orders to buy a specified price, uh, to buy shares for a specified price on the market to um, stabilize the price. Okay. Now, when the takeover offer is public, investment banks are usually involved as underwriters and consultants. First variant is a firm commitment agreement. With a firm commitment, the company negotiates an agreement with an investment bank to secure and market the new shares. So you have a number of shares, fixed number of shares that are bought by the underwriting investment bank and then sold by the underwriting investment bank at a higher price. The investment bank acts as an underwriter because it accepts the risk of the company that the company would otherwise not be able to sell all those stocks and shares. So this risk is transferred to the investment bank. However, the investment bank is now, of course, able to resell these um, stocks at a slightly higher price. And this spread or the discount that is granted to the underwriting investment bank, this difference between the purchasing price of the underwriter and the offer price, this is the syndicate fee. Why do we need a syndicate? A syndicate in this case is simply a corporation of many investment banks because in many, many IPOs, the risk of buying up all the shares that are issued, this risk is too large for one investment bank on its own. So many investment banks will cooperate. They will form a syndicate, which is nothing sinister. And this syndicate of investment bank will then underwrite the um, IPO in a firm commitments um, effort. We then also have best efforts. In this case, the underwriter acts as an agent and receives a commission for each share sold. And in contrast to the firm commitment, the underwriter does not buy the shares and therefore the bank doesn't bear any risk. So there's also no guarantee how much money will be raised. But in this case, of course, the investment bank um, will also probably make a smaller profit. Then. We also have a Dutch auction. In this case, the underwriter does not set a fixed price for the shares to be sold, but conducts an auction in which investors bid for the shares. And the bid price is determined by the bids placed and the company determines the highest bid price for a certain number of shares. It could also be that before the Dutch auction is done, uh, the investment bank will specify the final bid price will be between 20 and 30 euros, might be. And then investors might say, okay, I want 5,000 stocks. I want 10,000 shares. Now, firm commitment underwriting is more widely used for larger issues than best effort underwriting and smaller emissions primarily, primarily use best efforts due to the greater uncertainty of these issues. Quite clearly, if you are a large company that is going public, you have more bargaining power um, um, compared to smaller companies when it comes to investment banks. And in these large cases, you'll probably have a firm commitment underwriting, smaller emissions usually in these cases, investment banks will only uh, agree to a best efforts um, contract. For an offer of a certain size, the costs of best effort underwriting and firm commitment underwriting should be the same. 
And many underwriting contracts contain a so-called green shoe provision. That's the name of a company for which this was done the first time. It gives the investment banks the option to buy additional shares at the offer price after it's gone uh, public. And the reason for this green shoe option is to cover excess demand and oversubscriptions and it represents a benefit for the underwriting syndicate because the um, underwriting investment bank will only exercise this provision, this option, in case it can make a profit. So this is also an additional cost for the issuer, but it can lead to more equity being raised and this is a so-called green shoe provision. And last but not least, if the new security has been sold to the public for the first time, this is the period after this is called the aftermarket. And during this period, it could be that the consulting investment bank stands ready to buy additional uh, shares to stabilize the price, or they usually do not sell shares below the offer price. So again, they will stabilize uh, the aftermarket. What are investment banks doing? Uh, they provide advice, they market securities, they act as underwriters, they offer additional services related to this whole process of doing an IPO. The banks bear the responsibility of fair pricing and when a company goes public for the first time, the buyers have relatively little information about the company's operations and therefore they will look for the judgment but also the good name of the investment banks advising this company on that IPO. And investment banks thus have a self-interest in pursuing fair pricing, avoiding unethical transactions and ruining their reputation. There are then two methods of selecting the accompanying investment bank with a competitive offer. The issuing company can offer its securities to the highest bidding underwriter and with a negotiated offer, the company works together with an underwriter. So companies usually do not negotiate with several underwriters at the same time and thus negotiated deals suffer from a lack of competitions. And on the other hand, issue costs in negotiated deals are higher than in competitive deals. How should you set the price of the offer? Now, this is usually the most difficult task for the syndicate to choose the correct offer price for the initial issue. If the offer price is too high, the IPO can be unsuccessful. If it is below the true market price, existing shareholders suffer an opportunity loss. So um, either you could end up with raising too little capital and, uh, well, uh, sinking your IPO because you could have raised more capital. In the other alternative, if the IPO, if the sales price is too low, um, it could be that all equity is gone, but still your um, um, that um, the gains in the raised capital is also again too low. So this is rather tricky, and this is where um, you need. Uh, the investment bank to do a proper company valuation to come up at a fair sales price. It can be done by valuations through comparables. Again, we need to value the company. Financial analysts will check how much investors are willing to pay for one unit of an asset or for the profits of a group of similar investors and companies. You can use the book market value ratio. So this compares book value with market value. We've already seen this. You can use the price earnings ratio and these can then be calculated for a peer group of companies that are similar to the one that is going public. And then you can try to infer from the stock prices and the market capitalization of these companies in the peer group what the equity should be priced of this particular company that is going public. So valuation through comparison. Uh, you are trying to identify undervalued or overvalued security. If the ratio is higher or lower than one, then the share is undervalued or overvalued. A high price earnings ratio indicates that investors expect higher future revenue growth compared to companies with a lower price earnings ratio. And both ratios can differ considerably depending on the share, even if the companies are active in the same sector. And in this following table, you can see the book to market and price earnings ratios for selected companies in 2009. And as you can see, 
the book to market value and the price earnings ratio is sometimes equal between this particular company and its competitors for seasoned industries like say Johnson & Johnson, PepsiCo, Campbell's Soup or Walmart, so very seasoned rather old companies or Dow Chemical or Dell Computer. But if you take a look at Amazon, McDonald's, um, McDonald's, you can see the dramatic differences here. Um, obviously the book to market value and price earnings ratio for Amazon even in 2009 was much much higher than the one for its competitors which at that point well Amazon doesn't really have a competitor at the same level so it's probably um, traditional retail business and you can see that for some industries it does make sense uh, to value these companies while looking at competitors' uh, financial ratios and their market capitalization. But for unique companies like, say, Amazon, Apple, uh, also Tesla, it's very, very difficult to arrive at a fair price because of these difficulties. Okay, how can you price equity? Um, very simple, uh, by taking a look at the DCF, the discounted cash flow method. The first idea is simply start out what is a stock what rights does it give you it gives you the rights uh, and a claim to the next dividend payment to all future dividend payments and you can sell the stock after one period so if you only are interested in keeping the stock for one year you would see that your return should be the dividend at t1 plus the price you can get at t1 minus the price you have paid divided by the price you have paid for the shares. So this should be the return on your investment in this stock after one year. Now, on the other hand, given investors' forecasts of dividend, price and the expected return, you can simply turn this around and you can see that with this one year investment horizon, the price of the current, the current price, today's stock price, should look like dividend plus price at P1, at T1, divided by 1 plus R. This discount rate, R, is now called the market capitalization rate or the cost of equity capital. On this cost of equity capital, all market participants agree upon because all those participants are trading on the market and this is a market capitalization rate or cost of equity capital that is distilled from market participants' expectations um, on the market. Question now is what determines next year's price? Well again do the same thing. P1 is um, actually you can do the same here. You will see that this is P0 so this is P1 and we get the dividend in T2 and the price in D2. So this is what we do on and on and on. So this is P1 included in the price for P2. Then we have, again, we substitute P1 and we get uh, this formula. By combining these two, you can see that today's price depends on dividend one, dividend two, and P3. Continue this and you see that today's stock price is given by dividend one, dividend two, dividend three, dividend four, plus dividend five, plus price six go on and go on and in the end you get this formula it's a long sum of discounted dividends plus the price at some horizon age discounted over age periods assuming that the company lives on forever and you are not going to re to, to sell your stock you can actually say well age goes to infinity so this can be neglected, age becomes infinity, and you get this formula. The price today should be the infinite sum of discounted future dividend payments. It's a perpetual stream of cash dividends, and we know actually this is quite simple, um, because in this case, uh, what is um, this um, price? Assuming that the dividends are constant, let's say C, then P0 should simply be C divided by R. 
very simple asset pricing model, but as you can see, valuing a fair uh, stock price heavily depends on the assumption of this cost of equity R, and you can infer this cost of capital from the market, from the stocks that are already um, traded on the market, and then coming up with forecasts for the dividends, either with a growth factor or if you assume, okay, the dividends will be constant, you can simply take the dividend, future dividend forecast, uh, come up with the cost of equity and then calculate the fair stock price via this very, very simple uh, formula under some minor um, assumptions. Okay, hence the share value is equal to the discounted stream of dividends per share. And this DCF formula for the present value of a stock is the same as for any other asset because we just discount the cash flows by the opportunity cost of capital, the market capitalization rate. Now, again, note that this formula was derived from the assumption that the price in any period is determined by expected dividends and capital gains over the next period. Thus, there is no inconsistency in referring to the share value as the present value of the expected future dividends. Now, the same formulas that we use to value common shares can also be used to value entire business, that is, firm value, including debt and equity. For this to work, you have simply have to um, take this formula here, and those are the cash flows to equity holders. And if we substitute the dividends to equity holders by free cash flows, which are the payments to debt and equity holders, you get almost the same formula here and you can use the same method to value the firm as a whole. Okay, now let's turn to trading and structuring, the last function in investment banking. Now in sales and trading, you have a sales desk uh, and the sales desk is in charge of the trading uh, in securities on behalf of clients or on behalf of the investment bank itself in proprietary trading. So the sales desk of an investment bank tries to propose ideas for security transactions to institutional investors and it tries to submit offers to those clients. If a client then places an order, it will be forwarded to the trading desk which executes the order. And this of course both is the front desk of the investment bank. The trading desk, or simply referred to as the front office now, is uh, the department that executes the trading orders of its clients. And one part of the trading desk, the so-called proprietary trading, has no direct contact with clients and carries out security transactions on behalf of and for the account of the investment bank itself. In German, this is called Eigenhandel. Ja? Sie haben also den Eigenhandel der Investmentbank oder der Bank. Ne? Und was das bedeutet, ist, dass die Bank auf eigene Rechnung hier mit Wertpapieren handelt und nicht für Kunden oder Klienten. Then, structuring, structured financial product is a financial instrument that consists of one or more underlying securities and usually a derivative component that are combined and these structured finance products, they enable the investor to buy, sell a desired return risk profile without having to acquire the individual securities at full cost um, itself. What is done here, uh, for example, imagine you want this cash flow stream, sorry. In this case, you would say, well, this is a pretty simple uh, coupon bond. If you have a cash flow that looks like this, this is a zero bond. Sorry, a zero bond. But what would you do if you were interested in minus 100, 5, 7, 20, 0, minus minus 20, 105. You would say this is a cash flow that cannot be bought on the market, but you can try to replicate this cash flow by combining a zero bond with a coupon bond, maybe a derivative. And what structured financing and financial engineering does is 
um, investment banks will buy up in wholesale all these financial instruments and they will sell you a clear cut uh, individual structured financial products so that you can actually buy this type of no, let me use this here that you can buy this cash flow stream why would you not do this yourself as an institutional investor because you would have to buy let's say three assets a financial derivative and you have huge transaction costs the investment banks does this on a large scale and as a result can reduce the transaction costs it can also hedge its risk much better than you can and financial engineering structured financing means that the investment bank will produce they will create these financial instruments which are just securities uh, for you to buy and you as an institutional investor usually not as retail customer but as an institutional investor, you can tell the investment bank what cash flow stream you're actually looking for. So this is financial engineering as part of the investment bank sales and trading activities. Okay, so I've talked a lot about business models, investment banking now. Do you have any questions? Because the next part will uh, be about financial accounting for banks. We'll be talking about German accounting rules uh, that apply to banks operating in Germany. And I think it doesn't make any sense to continue here right now and to start with financial accounting today. So we'll rather do this next week. Do you have any questions concerning investment banking? I can also stop the recording now. So if you're uh, if you want to uh, post your questions in the chat window uh, or ask them now, um, first, thank you for your attention and let me stop the recording now.